actually the head of the tax policy unit at the Ministry of Finance. And to give a bit more detail to that, for us to talk about taxes, there must first be a policy. And the one that will be joining us for this conversation is the head of the unit responsible for tax policies in this country. The next person that I would also be introducing to join me on the panel for the purpose of today's conversation is actually the head of VAT at the Ghana Revenue Authority. What that actually means is that the policies are developed, parliament passes the policies into law, but the law must work. And the authority responsible for ensuring that the law works is the GRE, and the head of VAT would also be joining us here for the conversation. We obviously would like to apologize both to our in-person audience and our online guests for the delayed start. But I'll do very well not to go beyond the scheduled time that we have for today. Now, as we typically do, and to ensure that everyone is on the same page, we usually will start the conversation with a little bit of a presentation. And the whole idea is to get us all on the same page to help us to have an insightful conversation as we typically do. So we would appreciate if the slides are up so that our in-person guests and our online guests can follow the conversation. So over the next few minutes, we would be guided by the following agenda. We would set the background, which is what I intend to do in just about 10 or so minutes. We'll then move on to have a panel discussion. This panel discussion would be led, or the first presentation of the panel discussion will be led by the head of VAT. So what is EVAT? Is there a difference between EVAT and the e-invoicing? What do we need to know? And after he has done his presentation, we will then get into the session to have an insightful conversation. So to begin, any time we want to have a VAT conversation, we must always set into context four key points. The moment we appreciate these four key points, we can have whichever VAT conversation that we ought to have. So the very first thing is to ask ourselves, are we supplying a product? VAT is interested in supplying of products. Those products could be goods. Those products could be services. But what we are very much interested in is not just any kind of products, but products that are not exempt. So to explain, and I would like to do that by way of an example. When I go for medical services at an accredited health facility, the reason I don't pay VAT there is because we have agreed as a society to exempt medical services from VAT. If I send my words to school, whether it's to the university, whether it's to the secondary school, whether it's to the primary school, the reason why I don't see VAT invoices on the fees that I pay is because they are exempt. However, if you do not have things exempted, then the law requires us that ordinarily we need to have a VAT conversation. So to guide our conversation today, if whatever you are doing is not those things that have been exempt, then this conversation probably matters to you. Otherwise, you could just use it to expand your knowledge and then have a conversation when next you are exposed to VAT-related stuff. Even if you do not supply VAT stuff, it's quite important you understand this. So that if people are charging you VAT, you may know whether the VAT is wrong or correct. So two things we would discuss on the product later. But just bear in mind that now, for VAT conversation, you must know what product you are supplying and whether those products are exempt. Next is the fact that as a country, we do not want to deal with everybody. So you may be producing or you may be supplying things that are not exempt. But you want to spend money getting the GRE to chase you. If the answer is no, we must obviously define a threshold. So if you are doing business 
and your supplies do not exceed the equivalent of 200,000 over a 12 month period. And let me break that down. On average, or broadly speaking, if you do not supply anything more than 20,000 cities a month, we are obviously not interested in you unless you want to bring yourself into our net. Let's break down that further. 20,000 a month gives you about 5,000 cities a week. 5,000 cities a week, break down, down into working days, gives you roughly about 1,000 cities per day. So if you are doing anything and you are unlikely to be earning on average more than 1,000 Ghana cities, the GRA may not be interested in you unless you want to bring yourself into the VAT net. So that's the second thing that we need to know. Having brought yourself into the VAT net, the next thing that we need to be asking ourselves is what is the tax base? What is the tax rate? If I decide to walk into a vehicle showroom in this country, and the vehicles that are in those showrooms were assembled here in Ghana under automobile policy, then I could be walking away with a car which attracts a VAT rate of zero. I can walk into that same showroom and go to another part and pay VAT at a standard rate of 15% plus three levels that goes with it. Those three levels add up to six. And if you go with the GRA calculation, you get an effective standard rate of almost 22%. So what does that mean? You may be supplying products which are not exempt. You may be registered for VAT purposes. But then, that does not define the rate of tax that you pay yet. So once again, we must have this at the back of our mind as we get into an EVAT conversation. Are you sure you are setting up your system correctly? Should you be paying zero? and you are paying almost 22%, or should we be paying even 3%, plus 1%, but you are paying almost 22%. And all these things could affect your customers. And if you don't set up the right things in your EVA system, you will definitely have challenges later with a GRA. And the reason is simple. By doing EVAT, GRA is expecting you to pay a certain amount. When your check comes at the end of the month and it's different, then you have issues. So it's quite important we understand the setup. And the last thing, whenever you're having a VAT conversation, you must appreciate is how do we account for the tax? So VAT, even by its name, should tell you that you're talking about a tax on value addition. How do you determine whether you've added value? Where were we? Where are we, where are we now? Where were we? Where are we going to? That difference is a value add. So there's a difference between what you charge, it is not what you charge that necessarily goes to the government of Ghana. You must, in certain instances, take credit for what you incurred. But of course, there are rules around what you can incur and take credit for, amongst others. We're not going to go into that, all right? We're not going to go into those details today, but you need to appreciate this whenever you're having a VAT conversation. So going back, whenever you talk about products, two things must come to mind. If that product is not exempt, are you going to be charging VAT? Is the rate going to be positive or is it going to be zero? We need to have a conversation on that. You remember the 200,000 threshold I talked to you about. So it's not everybody that we are interested in. We're interested in those that we can actually employ people at GRA to go after. It's not everybody that we are interested in. Lastly, I talked about the issue around the tax base. Once again, a number of things inform that. So when I go to the shopping malls, maybe Malcolm, maybe ShopRite, and I see a price displayed, what does that mean? The product is going for 20 CDs. If I pay 20 CDs to the lady at the till or to the gentleman at the till, does the company keep all the 20 CDs? Those are questions we need to answer. Part of that money probably ends up with the government of Ghana for our roads to be constructed, for our policemen to be paid, for our soldiers to be catered for, amongst others. Lastly, once again, remember this. We're going to be talking about EVAT. Invoices matter. Invoices matter. A couple of years ago, we all remember that there was a memo, we can describe it as a leaked memo, that came out from the GRA, where the Commissioner General was directing his team that going forward, if you go and do your audits, and the VAT, invoice that should be there is not there. 
even though you are not having a VAT conversation, but you're having an income tax conversation, the VAT related expense and the product that you possibly bought should be disallowed for income tax purposes. So you start with something that borders on VAT, you end up with something that borders on income tax. So audience, it is quite important to get the VAT invoice right. And as we currently speak, just to get everybody on the same page, last year in September, we passed a new law. That new law was what started a whole EVAT conversation. And subsequent to the passage of that law, we remember the GRU going out, locking down some shopping malls. Some of us, of course, had some reservations to doing that, but well, they went ahead and did it. At the time it was done, the law that was passed by Parliament provided a one-year transition period for everyone to move from the manual invoices that we are currently issuing to an electronic form of invoice, which has been synced. And one of my moderate, one of my panel members, sorry, will be addressing the issue of that EVAT. So the law was passed. We were given about one year to transition fully. After all the locking up and things happened, our ministry went back to parliament, and we are happy we now have the head of the Ministry of Finance session responsible for tax policies here with us. They went to parliament, convinced parliament to take away that particular one-year transition period. So as we currently speak, if you are issuing an invoice, and that invoice is coming out from a system that has not been integrated into the GRA system, then you are possibly issuing an invoice you should not be issuing a problematic invoice. And that was my problem when they went to Parliament and I was saddened that Parliament gave the approval. Because as we speak now, we are all potential lawbreakers because people are in queue to ensure that they issue those invoices. So probably we'll hear from the head of VAT, we'll hear from the man responsible for tax policies at the Ministry of Finance to probably tell us why the law was changed and to put us all in this very uncomfortable position as we find ourselves. Usually when I have a conversation, I say my conversation or my issue is not with those at the top. My issue is or are with those who are doing the audits. They would forget that probably they didn't have the full readiness to migrate everybody at the same time. You'll be audited in 2026, three years from now. Somebody will come and check and say that, did this invoice come from a certified invoice system? Your answer is no, then you have issues. You have to now go and beg and beg and beg, and that is not what certainly we, we do want. So at this stage, I think the platform has been set. Let's remember the context of our conversation we would be focusing on invoices. What sort of invoice are we going to rely on going forward? We must remember this, the conversation is on invoices. But not just on invoices, they are stemming from the kind of product you supply. They are arising from whether you should be registered or not. It is critical you get your tax rate properly set up into your invoices. Otherwise, there would be issues at the end of the day. So I will stop invites the head of tax policy at the Ministry of Finance if he is ready. Otherwise, we would move to the head of VAT and then subsequently get a question number one to him to ask why the change that Parliament did and what are we going to do for us not to be potential lawbreakers. You want to address just that one? Okay. So, thank you very much, Mr. Dan Nye. Please, over to you. And then, Philip, subsequently, you continue with the same presentation for us to appreciate what the EVAT is. And one of the questions I've already received is, people keep hearing EVAT, people keep hearing e-invoicing. Is there any difference? It's just a, a terminology thing. Thank you very much.
to address the specific issues that uh, our moderator just raised, we, the change was not to bring, create a problem for everybody. Actually, the idea was to spread the um, onboarding of people onto the feed, onto the system over a year. The law that was passed wasn't that clear. So it was assumed that everybody had a year to transition. But the idea was that when the commissioner, the commissioner you know, will inform you of when to transition and then during their period, the period he gives you, you transition over that period. And so the one year was taken off, not because we changed, not to make it everybody corporate or everybody a criminal, to put it that way, a tax criminal, but then to allow the commissioner general to continue in his business. So if you've not been asked by the commissioner general that he told that he's coming to, um, for example, move you onto the system, well, currently we are working with the first batch of people, or traders as we call them, as soon as we finish, we'll go the, to the next batch and you'll be given some notice as to um, when you'll be transitioning onto the new system. So I just wanted to put that clarification. It's not to make uh, tax criminals out of everybody, but just to allow the fees approach to be used. So it was a correction, not a change in essence. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, for that uh, wonderful opening remarks. And also, uh, Dan, thank you for, for uh, providing that clarification. So uh, my name again is Phil Akwa. I'll be uh, presenting on the electronic invoicing system, basically going through uh, a number of items on the agenda, if we can go to the next slide, um, which has, yeah, sorry. All right, so on the agenda today, uh, we'll look at what an electronic invoicing system is. And basically, let me address this question that you raised as to EVAT, electronic invoicing system, e-invoicing system, they all, uh, they all the same. Uh, EVAT is a technology to just make it short and easy for everyone to remember. Uh, electronic invoicing can be a math form. So EVAT is the simplest form that uh, form of slogan that we could come up with. So we'll go through uh, what electronic invoicing system, why we are implementing this solution, the benefit of electronic invoicing system, both to the TASPIA and to GRE. And then we look at the architecture, that's the technology behind, uh, behind the system. And then we'll look at how the technology works. Uh, just to give you some few examples uh, looking at POSs and the rest of it. And then the implementation roadmap. What have we done to date uh, in implementing the system? And how a taxpayer can register onto the EVA system, compliance and monitoring aspects of the system. And then we uh, allow for, uh, for you to ask questions. So this should take us roughly 20, 25 minutes to complete. So what is electronic invoicing? Uh, so basically, it is a system that transforms the manual invoicing system. And as uh, Mr. Um, Egan said, uh, Mr. Abiku said, the, uh, the default for issuing an invoicing system pre, uh, before the law was, uh, the VAT Act was amended, was that taxpayers are to issue manual invoice. The manual invoice is the one that's the booklet that uh, the Commission General provides to taxpayers uh, to issue invoices. Now, if a taxpayer has uh, his own computer system and wants to issue an invoice using that computer, then they have to apply for what we call a dispensation to issue their own invoices. In those cases, uh, the taxpayer is granted a year and then to issue their, and then they have to apply for uh, renewal uh, to that effect. So what we are doing now is uh, the dispensation now has become the default, where taxpayers are now asked to issue invoices using an electronic system. So what we are doing is not anything new. It is uh, it's some, it's a system that taxpayers are used to. All we are doing here is uh, what, we, what we have on the right-hand side here, which 
GRA is now authenticating and validating the invoices that are issued from taxpayers' own system, such that now the issue of electronic invoice is the default. Um, and but GRA or Commissioner General wants to authenticate and validate the invoices that are issued in real time or near real time. So that's really what this system is. So just as an example, when you go to ShopRite or Maximat or Quatsons and you purchase uh, something from there and you go to the till, the till that's used is in itself an electronic invoicing system. But Commissioner General has basically connected uh, his own system into uh, that POS system so that on issuing invoices, uh, the, the, the Commissioner General, Commissioner General signature will be appended on those receipts or invoices uh, for easy uh, validation and authentication. Though that is in a nutshell what this system is. It is not anything new. We are not introducing any new law. All we are doing is, or uh, any new rate. All we are doing is we are connecting uh, Commissioner General's invoicing system to taxpayers' already invoicing system, such that now the issuance of electronic invoice is made a default. So why are we introducing this system? We all know that the manual invoicing uh, regime that we had uh, was and continued to be uh, uh, a system that is fraught with many challenges. We have invoices that are forged. In fact, we have some print houses in the country where you can actually go buy a manual invoice, use it to issue an invoice, collect the VAT and never pay to the authority. And this is a major problem that causes revenue leakage for the authority. We have what we call carden, where uh, some people uh, basically, or some taxpayers, uh, issue invoices and they put a card, uh, a card between the original and the carbon copy. And then they write a lower amount when the invoice is issued on the original, uh, a higher amount. And then when they issue the invoice, they basically uh, pocket the, the difference between what is collected and what is uh, paid to the, to the authority. These two, together with a lot of other uh, infractions, lead to overstatement of input and understatement of output. And of course, this results in loss of revenue to the authority. There's also lack of data for effective uh, compliance. So as you can imagine, issuing invoices uh, manually uh, for GRA to collect those invoices and analyze and do effective compliance becomes extremely difficult. So, and this of course leads to significant man hours when it comes to the audit work that's done by the authority. So these generally are, are not exhaustive in itself, but uh, a list of some problems that we have with the manual invoicing regime. For which reason we are moving to the electronic invoicing system. So one may ask, uh, what's the benefit of this system to me as a taxpayer? And then we've listed a few of them here. So this system will allow uh, any, anyone at all to be able to validate an invoice. So imagine you purchase from a taxpayer who is connected to the system, they issue an invoice, you will instantly be able to validate that invoice, that that invoice is a genuine invoice uh, if they are connected to the Commissioner General's invoicing system. And it's a benefit because it means that if you claim, make an input claim on that particular purchase, GRA is not going to reject that uh, input claim that you made. And also, it helps with record keeping. So, I'll walk through the different versions of the invoicing system that we have. Um, you see how that works. But GRA is giving taxpayers a free invoicing system to use. Uh, and therefore, if you are a taxpayer who uh, happens to be in the informal sector, who do not have uh, an invoicing system, this invoicing system that GRA provides you, allow you to, allows you to keep record and be able to formalize your business, which of course by implication means if you have a formal uh, way of keeping records, you can go easily go to the bank and then show them what your p &L looks like for easy access to loans. And of course, it helps you to formalize your business as well. One of the concerns we've, hear, uh, we've heard is that uh, the current regime, the manual regime, uh, does not allow 
uh, a lot of taxpayers to come on board because it becomes very difficult for GRA to um, identify all the taxpayers that are register registrable and bring them on board. So we want to create a fair and equitable VAT regime. And what this system does is it allows us to be able to identify those taxpayers that are not uh, issuing invoices or that are registrable that needs to be brought on board. So this will, to a large extent, help to uh, create a fair and equitable VAT uh, regime. Also, we want to reduce the cost of compliance to taxpayers. As you can imagine, if you operate in a manual regime and you issue invoices, by the time you collate all the invoices to file, it takes you quite a long time. You have to employ an accountant and the rest of it. We're not taking your work from you, by the way. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but what that does is now, because of you have the system, it allows one to be able to see all the invoices they've issued, invoices that have been issued to them in one centralized place, which uh, aids in reducing the cost of compliance. We also want to streamline the reporting of VAT returns, which means that in the, the end state of this system will allow one to be able to file what we call pre-populated returns. So imagine a world where uh, you have a portal and then you have all the invoices that have been issued and have been issued to you all sent to that portal, which now uh, is used to populate the VAT returns. So it becomes more or less like a declaration. You go onto that portal, you check, you're happy with the returns, and you submit. This will streamline the filing of VAT returns uh, a lot. And also we want to streamline the entire refund process. Uh, as because the GRA will know uh, what refund is due to you at any point in time. So, what are the benefits of this system to GRA? Now, I mentioned that this system allows us to formalize the informal sector. So, to a large extent, it will help us to identify those taxpayers, to widen the tax base as well. Also, uh, it's a, pl a platform that allows for GRA to be able to facilitate uh, the return processing, which means the time that you spend, the time we spend to process your return will be quicker. Uh, direct uh, suppression of, uh, detect suppression of sales. So this allows us to detect where a taxpayer is suppressing sales because now GRA knows all the sales that you're making in real time and near real time. And then uh, any fictitious claims that are made for refund can be identified as well. Easy tracking of non evidence of VAT collected, again, will be brought to fore. Now, the, we're going to look at the architecture behind this technology, basically the flow of how the technology works. So if you follow me carefully here, on the right-hand side where we have the PEPO, uh, that's basically the Commissioner General's invoicing system, what we call the Certified Invoicing System of the Commissioner General. And then on the left-hand side is where we have the taxpayer system. In between, it's just a communication channel uh, between the taxpayer system and the commissioner general system. The green at the bottom is where for taxpayers who already have their own invoicing systems. So ERP is an enterprise resource planning system. Point of sale, um, you know, is just what you see at the at the, uh, at the tills or at the supermarket when you go to purchase. We have accounting software. These are various systems that taxpayers have or use. So for those taxpayers that already have systems, what GRA does is GRA connects uh, the, the, the taxpayer system to the invoicing system of the, of, of the Commissioner General through what we call the API, application, application programming interface. So this whole thing is done between the GRA technical team and the taxpayer, such that after the integration is done or after the API connection is done, GRA is now able to authenticate and validate invoices that are used by taxpayers. We also have what we call the free invoicing system, which is at the top there, where GRA provides taxpayers who don't have any system at the moment, who use the manual invoice to issue invoices three versions of the free invoicing system. These invoicing system can be accessed by desktop, or you can access by, uh, by mobile phone, or you can access them online. 
And these invoice system systems are available for use free of charge. And it's what we call the pre-certified invoicing system, which means that there's no integration that's required. It's already, certi already certified by GRA. So it is just as good as once we onboard you onto the system, you are good to go to start using the invoicing system. And then the connection between the commission generous invoice system to the TASPIA uh, portal is what you see at the very top there, where the return processing takes place. So once all the invoices have been issued and invoices have been issued to you, it's just a matter of the, those transactions, uh, each individual invoice collated, put together, and sent to the TASPIA portal to facilitate filing. So I'll walk through, you through how the technology works. So again, the purple here is a commission generated invoice system. You see we have numbering one, two, three, four, five, up to six. Number one is where a taxpayer who is called, with, for, this, for, the, for this purpose here, just to use that as an example, uh, Dan Max Teller, or POS. So this is a situation where a taxpayer has his or her own invoicing system and issuing invoices using uh, that particular system. Now, Dan Matt opens, uh, comes, to, comes to work, and then switches on their POS system. What happens is the POS system immediately, once it goes online, connects or makes a call to Commissioner General's invoicing system, which is the number one that you see there. And then Commissioner General's invoicing system sends a key, a signature key, to Danmat POS. Once that takes place, and this all takes place within a split second, once that takes place, the key is stored within the server of Danmat. And then on a going forward basis, for that particular day, all the invoices that are issued will be authenticated and validated by GRA. So at this point, the taxpayer can go offline and start issuing invoices. So number three is where uh, the customer presents the items to uh, the teller uh, at Danmat. Uh, they scan, who are, uh, they scan the, uh, the items, and then uh, before the invoices are issued, signature uh, keys, uh, signature and invoice, uh, commission general signature is appended on the receipt before it's given to the final customer or final consumer. Now, number six is where the data that is, uh, that is taken for that particular transaction is sent back to the Commissioner General's invoice system. And this takes place not a, in some cases immediately if the taxpayer is operating offline. If not uh, operating offline within 24 hours, the information is sent back to the Commissioner General's invoice system. Now, this now gives an example of where you have a taxpayer who is using the free invoicing system. So we have one, two, three, and four. Because the system is already pre-certified, that taxpayer does not need to uh, go through the integration as I explained in the earlier slide. slide. But there's a signature that's acquired when Dan Max, uh, in this case, Mary Wine Shop, uh, opens their shop and then connects to the the invoicing system of Commissioner General, and then issues an invoice, and then uh, starts uh, and then gives that invoice to the uh, to the customer with the uh, Commissioner General signature on the invoice. So pretty much same as the other one. The only difference here is that the connection between the taxpayer system and the Commissioner General system is instant. So you do not have to go through the process of re-establishing links and the rest of it. Everything is all pre-certified, it's pre-connected to commission engineering system. Now, I'll go through the implementation roadmap, what the implementation plan is and what we've done. Um, we started off with 50 taxpayers and the go live date was October 1st, 2022. As of now, the pilot phase has been completed um, and all the taxpayers that uh, were piloted, this system was piloted to, are issuing invoices on the system. Now, phase one is where we will be rolling out to 600 taxpayers. Um, and then, based on feedback that we received, the selection of these taxpayers will be based on the sectors 
uh, you know, and industries that the taxpayers operate in, so that we bring in taxpayers that operate in similar sectors together in the onboarding. Phase two uh, will be 1,000 taxpayers. Again, that the timeline for that uh, phase, phase one is by June, end of June 2023. And then by the end of 2023, we hope to have finished onboarding additional 1,000 tax, uh, taxpayers. Phase two has just begun. We have started engaging uh, some taxpayers uh, with respect to that. And then all the taxpayers by phase three, in the phase three, which is December 31st, 2024. So this is the timeline in implementing the system. And of course, this is being done in phases as outlined here. Now, in preparing for the implementation of the system, we've done four major things. One is we've amended the law, and the, our moderator rightly mentioned this. And uh, the amendment uh, basically made the issuance of electronic invoice a default, and ensure, uh, it mainly uh, required taxpayers to connect the, their invoicing system to the invoicing system of the Commissioner General. And then it has all the punitive measures for not doing so. And of course, we went ahead and amended the law with the transition provision that was discussed uh, earlier on. We've also done a number of stakeholder engagements. We started uh, stakeholder engagement uh, way back in uh, last year, early last year. And as at uh, this, this month, we've, uh, we've started uh, sending letters to taxpayers to engage them in the next phase of the rollout. We've also developed the system based on feedback that we've uh, received from taxpayers, based on the several engagements that we've done. For which reason we have these three major categories of the free invoicing system. We have the API for those taxpayers who already have their own invoicing system. And what we're also doing is, we also realize that there are some software developers who are also developing invoicing systems that are not yet used by taxpayers. For those software developers, we're creating an economy around them by allowing them to send uh, application to Commissioner General so that uh, those softwares can be approved for use by taxpayers. And what we, that's what we call the third party certification process, uh, which we're currently working on. That's part of um, what GRA is doing at the moment to allow for a wider rollout and bring in different softwares into the implementation. Of course, I've talked about the phases of implementation, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, this is the, uh, the Act, the, the 1082 Act, which brought into force the issuance of electronic invoice, which talks about uh, the invoicing system of the uh, taxpayer uh, having to be connected to the invoicing system of Commissioner General and the relative um, sanctions for not doing so. So most of, most of you have already seen this. And then of course, this now goes into the subsequent act, amendment of the act, uh, the 1087 act, that looks specifically at um, the transition provision that we talked about earlier on, and also um, the increasing the punitive measures for not uh, complying with the act. Now, how does a taxpayer register to issue an electronic invoice. So there are three main uh, approaches to this. The first is uh, by selection. So GRA, as I went through uh, in the earlier slide, uh, because we're implementing this system by thesis, GRA will select a group of taxpayers and invite you in a form of a, a breakfast meeting and then walk through the system with you, with your software developers or your implement, uh, technical team, and then explain the system to you. And if you have any questions, we will address those as part of the onboarding process. You will be assigned a relationship manager who will work, will work with you to ensure that you are onboarded onto the system up until when the onboarding is completed. Of course, you'll be sent and onboarding forms to be completed, which will ask you a series of questions based on the system that you used and the rest of it. And then that will take us through the process of onboarding. 
Of course, there are back and forth that take place throughout that onboarding process. There's also voluntary registration for existing taxpayers. So you are an existing taxpayer uh, who has not been invited. The question is, what do you do? Right? You can write to Commissioner General, and Commissioner General would then assign a relationship manager, manager to you. Onboarding forms will be sent to you, and you'll be onboarded. Now, this particular step is still a work in progress, I must say. Uh, where currently the concentration has been on the selection of taxpayers based on sectors because of feedback that we receive. And of course, we have uh, by application for new taxpayers. So if you're a new taxpayer, what should you do uh, when you register for VAT? Again, the process is similar to voluntary registration. You write to Commissioner General, you'll be assigned a relationship manager onboarding forms will be sent to you and then the onboarding process will take place from there. Now, in terms of uh, the process flow of being onboarded really depends on uh, which system that the taxpayer uses. So if you're a taxpayer who is currently using a manual invoicing system, the process is very simple. We will, once we, if it's by selection, we have the breakfast meeting, walk you through uh, the demonstration of the free invoicing software. We train you on how the free invoicing software works, and then we will do the setup and everything for you. And then we'll walk you through the whole UAT, USF system, so for you to be satisfied that the system meets your needs, uh, you know, take into account uh, certain nuances that your business has. And then you will be ushered into the go live stage. And of course, if you use the ERP or POS, uh, and you have your own invoicing system, you will need to do integration through the application programming interface. Then the UAT will start, and then you go live, and then if there's a need for us to visit you to ensure that the go live is smooth, we'll do so accordingly. Now, to ensure the effective implementation of the system, we've introduced uh, compliance and monitoring tools to aid in the uh, implementation of the system. So we have what we call the heartbeat. We also have a revenue monitoring uh, dashboard, and we have verification. What the heartbeat does is it tells us uh, in GRE at any point in time which taxpayer is online, which taxpayer is offline, such that we don't have to be going to the taxpayer's premises to see if they're actually using the system. So if my, do I still have time? All right. So. I'll just walk through this quickly. This is the, how the, that beat, uh, the heartbeat looks like. Uh, the green indicates the taxpayers that are cur currently issuing invoices, just a snapshot of uh, the heartbeat that we took some time ago. And then the red indicates that taxpayers who are issuing invoices but have either gone offline or have not come online for quite an, a, a number of hours. And then so with this, GRA is able to obtain the data that's necessary to effect their compliance exercise that needs to be done. Now, we also have the, uh, the revenue dashboard. That tells us uh, the taxpayers who are issuing invoices up to, uh, it gives us details of the invoice they're issuing, the VAT that's charged on the invoices, if, they, if those uh, items are exempted, uh, all those are also indicated to us in the dashboards, we're able to see the invoice level detail of every single invoice that's issued by the taxpayer. So in a live environment, if you click on where we have view there, it will take you to this screen, which shows you details of the invoice at a very line item. And it shows you the unit price, the quantity, the total amount. It shows you if the, uh, the vertible uh, amount, um, and it shows you the tax, the VAT, the NHR get fund, and the rest of it. So we're able to see uh, in GRA, the invoice level detail of every single invoice that's issued uh, by the taxpayer. And this, of course, helps us collect data uh, to do a lot of analysis and follow up where we see any anomalies. The invoice is also encrypted um, with uh, security features, which means it's extremely difficult for the invoice to be faked. Now, we also have verification tool which means that customers and taxpayers, NGRA staff, can verify the authenticity of an invoice or, uh, or validate an invoice. And this can be done using just a normal QR code, 
we are introducing more features which will allow for uh, taxpayers or the general public to be able to uh, use this more effectively. And what we're doing with this is uh, to aid the compliance exercise, we're also introducing the, uh, the raffle, a raffle program, which will allow anyone who scans an invoice to be entered into a, raf a raffle, such that if you scan an invoice and we obtain the data, you will stand a chance of winning uh, some big prizes somewhere down the line. So this is a typical invoice. The QR code here is scannable. Once you scan, it gives you an indication of whether or not the invoice is valid. And you know, in this case, if you were to have sc you should scan this invoice and you were to be put into uh, uh, the draw and you are to win, then that will effectively encourage you to continue to issue an invoice, uh, a certified invoice. So this screen here shows where uh, the result of scanning an invoice, what you will see. You see that if the invoice is uh, truly uh, uh, genuine, it will indicate verified on there. And then it will give you all the details of the invoice that has been issued to you. So we also have, uh, we're also able to track invoices that are verified, invoices that are fake, and invoices that um, have been reported to us that have not come to our back end. So all data, all, that, uh, all this data is available to GRA, such that it allows us to track any fake invoice and follow up on taxpayers who are, uh, or uh, uh, you know, yeah, anyone who is trying to compromise with the system. Verified invoices, we're able to see where in the dashboard, it tells us if an invoice is verified. And there are situations where an invoice is not verified. It also tells us which is over here. As you can see, just giving some examples here, just to, for the purpose of testing. So the system is robust. It has all the compliance tools and uh, components that we need in order to make it work. But it's still yet uh, a new system. I know that it will take taxpayers quite a lot, uh, a lot of time to get used to it. But that is why we're having such dialogue. Right? We want to hear from you what we can do to improve the system as we roll out to the next phase of the, of the project. So we're really looking forward to collaborating with you <coughs> and working with you, making sure that the system is robust enough to serve your need. Thank you so much. All right, Phil. So thank you very, very much. And um, I would please invite you to join me here, um, whilst we wait to hear from the head of the tax policy unit at the Ministry of Finance. We know very well, we know, that not every part of this country has good internet. I am somewhere in the interlands. The law is now saying that unless I get some preferential treatment by the Commissioner General. That invoice I was writing small, small, should no longer be recognized. Or I'm just making supplies of 500,000 a year. Because I'm thinking about myself, I've not even incorporated a company. I still run a big coin sense. Am I sure I can employ some IT techish accountant to sit behind this thing to make sure that me, that illiterate, illiterate man, can actually do all this? So Dan, please, can you let us know why the country thinks that this is an appropriate time for migrating to an electronic invoicing system? Thank you very much. OK. Thank you, Abeku, and um, at least we've seen the, have a general idea of what the invoicing system looks like. Um, let's, do, let's step back a bit and look at revenue generation or mobilization generally in the country. And if we look at our budgets all the way, I don't know how far back we'll go, we always realize that we've been running deficits. Expenditure is always more than revenue. I mean, we are not, the, all, all, all countries basically run, in fact, in economics, 
people don't like a revenue surplus. Mostly it's a, it's a, it's a deficit. So the other thing is that though we are running that deficit, our deficit is quite large and our tax to GDP is quite low. Uh, tax to GDP normally, you want to explain it the easiest form to say that for all that we produce in the country, if it's 100 cities, how much of it do we collect as tax? And so basically around this area, around 13 point something percent of GDP. Whereas if we look at other places who we call our peers, or even those below us, the sub-Saharan average, average is around 15%. If you go further, we are supposed to lower middle income is around 20%. So it means that the less tax we collect, the lower our ability to develop or to provide the services that we need to give to citizens. So there's been this drive over the years to get more tax. But then, collecting tax comes at a cost. Both to the person who is paying the tax and the person who is collecting it. So there's been a drive over a number of years to move into using technology to do the things we have to do. Both in collecting the tax and also for the person who is paying. Uh, Abeku asked whether, why, whether this is the right time. In fact, the, uh, the, real, uh, the right time was in 2018, when we passed what we call the Fiscal Electronic Device Act at that time. That is the time that we should have done it. Quite a number of things, there's been change in technology, technology moves very fast. So we realized at a point in time that it was easier using the software, doing something for mobile phones, and for the person who doesn't have internet asset, he can use his mobile phone. So he's offline, he does not have internet, but once he has a mobile phone asset, he can do that on his mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easy. There are quite a number of items that have been put in place to make it possible for you to generate the invoice, whether you are online or offline. So in that way, you'd, um, we, we've covered that part of it. And the other reason why we are doing it in phases mm -hmm. is to be able to bring in those who you can easily get on board while we sort out the, how to get those who have challenges getting on board, on board. So that by the end of the second year or the third year, as we've put it, we expect that we'll have that aspect that covered. So those are some of the things. So as we said, technology helps, it, it brings efficiency. One of the things that we'll realize with this system also is that there's a certain form of what they will call a supply chain management. Because as you are getting your invoices and all these things in, it helps you to monitor your sales yourself. So there are some people who don't, can't, I mean, as you say, you, right now you keep a book and you write your sales in. When you have this, it means that you have it in, in electronically. So you now also have that information to use for even your, your own self and to help you to not just do VAT, but even for your income taxes. Because this is your turnover. So when you're doing all these things, it helps in order. It's linked to the, there's a link to the customs management system so that when you're importing, you would bring all this in. So the general idea is to make things simple for everybody. When it comes to filing, as he mentioned, the portal is there. It allows you to go there. And you see, the portal is not just for VAT, as we said. It's for um, income tax. So we are, we are helping you to bring everything together in one place to help you file your taxes and pay your, pay, file your returns, pay your taxes. It also helps us also to do that. So it's basically a win-win situation. And it is the way really to go for all of us so that we can improve our revenue base. And VAT, to tell the truth, our VAT um, collection is very low. There's one thing that I'll move aside in terms of VAT accounting. And I'm sure the moderator is the accountant, I'm not an accountant. Where there's something we've realized with a lot of people, and this would help though it's at the front end, is when the person is paying, is that a lot of us, when we are doing our pricing, we pay VAT on the things that go into our businesses. And that VAT, when we are costing, making, doing our price build-up, should not form part of the price build-up. You should take it out before you add your margins and other things, and then come out with the final price. Because at the end of the day, 
you are able, you are allowed to recover that one from government. So it's not an expense for you, for you to include it in your expenses. Unfortunately, we realize that quite a number, especially those of us, the middle, um, smaller taxpayers and other things, do not take advantage of these things. And so we keep the VAT that is there, and then we come and add more VAT on it. And for the efficiency, we say that then there's an exponential increase in your listing. What you're doing is that you're making your things expensive when you shouldn't make them expensive. Because once you take out that 12 or 15 percent, at least it brings it lower down. Whatever you're adding to it becomes lower. And if it happens that this happens for, um, for maybe one chain, it might not be too much. But if the product goes through several chains, by the time it gets to about the fifth one or the fourth one, and the VAT is not taken out, what it means is that, let's, let's look at it, 15%, then another 15%, and another 15%. So you would have put into your cost 60% that you shouldn't have put there. And so your items are expensive, and you don't understand why it's expensive. And you are blaming the tax when it's the accounting. So some of the things we expect that some of these things will do is that it will help us do the accounting, and we should also be um, talking to Uncle Abeku today, I'm promoting him since I'm in his office. Talk to him, he'll help you to do the accounting so that you have reasonable prices for your items. Otherwise, this expense part will continue and we'll blame in a tax when really is the way we are doing the computation. So I want to end on that, that we're using technology to bring up um, mobilized revenue and also help the person who is also paying the revenue. Thank you. And um, this is the section I actually enjoy. Um, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Um, my in-person audience, you would have the opportunity to ask questions by voice. But permit me to start with some of the questions I've received here to clarify some of the presentations that have been made. And Mr. Nier and Phil, um, what I'm going to do is, if I'm not careful, the number of questions I have will just put one of you under too much pressure. So feel comfortable to address any of the questions that I, I pose. So the first thing is about the implementation. Um, so you are looking at having certain things done at certain times. So you have the pilot, you have the 600, you have the medium taxpayers and then others. The first question I have is that somewhere last year or last two years, the government reclassified taxpayers into large taxpayers and all others. Following that, there was a renaming of even the tax offices from MTO, STOs to area offices and taxpayer service centers. So when you are talking about medium, and the reason why this question is coming up, is that if by June or by December, the medium guys should move, which of the medium guys are we talking about? Is it those who were formerly with MTUs despite the fact that their names have changed? What should they know? The other question that is also coming up is that much as we can appreciate that you need a timetable, what is actually happening is that with the uncertainties as to when a particular period would close, we would have in the system a number of invoices running. So you have the CGs or the Commissioner General's invoices. You have those you would have given approval to issue their own internal generated invoices. And now you have what I choose to call the CIS or the Certified Invoices System Invoices. So if I am a customer, how do I even get to know which stage 
my particular person is and which invoices I should be using. And the last question for now is, if I'm issuing an invoice, I need to get a check from the GRE system for me to continue my process. I am not getting the checks coming through as quickly as I want. The customers that I'm dealing with are such that if I don't issue the invoices now, I have issues. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a shipping line, or I'm an agent of a shipping line. We know that if I don't claim my goods quickly, I incur something we all call demorage, we all, we all want to avoid. So issue me with invoice. The GRE system is down, day one, day two. Day three, I'm not able to issue. There is demorage. Who pays for that? Government of Ghana, the agent, the customer, who addresses all these things? And what are the measures to address instances where the GRE system is down and there are real costs, just like the example I've given in this particular instance? So we'll start with these four questions. I would give some more, then go to my in-person audience, and then we can continue. Thank you very much. All right. So I will take the, the I'll take all three, actually. Okay. So the first one, uh, how do we categorize taxpayers? And I, I hear you, uh, there was characterization, and then we changed it and the rest of it. So uh, Dan did mention earlier on that the, the need for you to be onboarded as a taxpayer is the sole discretion of Commissioner General. Mm. So for you to be invited by, to be onboarded, well, you will be sent a letter by Commissioner General and you will be invited into a, uh, a breakfast meeting and the rest of it. The categorization by revenue will be done based on the parameters that we set <coughs> and based on the sectors as I explained in my earlier slide. So as it stands now, as, you, as we discussed earlier on, all taxpayers are to be onboarded. However, the need to be onboarded is the sole discretion of the Commissioner General. And the, uh, and the determination of the revenue threshold that is to be used to determine who is to be onboarded is at the sole discretion of the Commissioner General. So I don't want us to confuse the uh, definition of medium taxpayers back then to what we are doing here, right? So I just want to make that point clear. The Commissioner General's sole discretion uh, is what will be used to uh, onboard the taxpayer based on revenue threshold that is defined, uh, he defines. And also, I'll address your last question on no response uh, from Commissioner General's invoice system. Now, the good thing about the pilot that we have done is we have used that to study uh, the system and to understand some of these issues. Uh, we've had issues where, uh, like you rightly said, uh, either the taxpayer system is down or there's no response from the, uh, the CIS, as you term it. In those cases, we have perfected the system with time. Okay. And when a taxpayer has complained that I need to issue an invoice but I'm not getting response from the uh, from the CIS, GRA's technical team are always on the line to address the issues. And what the solution is, we've always asked the taxpayer to share what we call the any desk, more or less like a remote address. And instantly, we'll be working with the taxpayer right there and then to address the issues that they have. And we've done this for the likes of Ghana Port and Harbour Authority. Right. Uh, just yeah. to mention some names, just to understand the magnitude of transactions that they deal with, just to buttress your point. That and yet, as we as we speak, they are issuing invoices with the uh, you know in this particular instance uh, as we speak, and all with all their issues resolved. Okay. okay. So, uh, and then that the, the the last one is, how do I know which invoice to use? So. You may, like, it's a transitional period, right? Okay. So at any point in time, you may have a taxpayer who has been granted dispensation to issue their own invoice, 
and at some point in that process, before the end of the month, they are onboarded onto the system. Now, for the purpose of filing, you add all those invoices that you issued uh, together. If you did not uh, capture the invoices that you issued using the commercial business invoices into your own system, you will add that to what you issued from your own system for the purpose of filing. However, when a taxpayer uh, did, uh, has done an integration onto the commercial business invoices system, you would expect that the data that we have on the commercial general system is also captured in the taxpayer system, right? Yeah. Such that they can use that information, that data that they have in their own invoices for the purpose of filing. So we want to separate the issuance of invoice from filing, right? So if you have issued an invoice using a manual uh, regime, you have your own invoice system and you have commercial general general invoice system. Okay. You just have to make sure that you've done a reconstruction. Okay. And to the extent that you are only not you are not duplicated, but you only account for the invoice you issued in that particular. Okay. All right. Then any additions from your end? Oh, no, As okay. I said, it's just similar to what we have already. In fact, we have similar invoices in the system even before the invoice, and the same thing happens. Okay. It just fits up. All right. So some additional questions that just came through. One is asking. For clarity's sake, would it be too much to ask the GRE to issue a public notice, clearly spelling out that if you've not been invited to come for a continental or English breakfast, don't worry yet. Nobody will pull the new law in your face to tell you that you are potentially becoming a tax criminal. Would it be too much to ask so that people can go to bed on that? The second question that has come, and I will quote it as it just came, um, of course, without mentioning the person's name, and I'll do some addition. It says, how does EVAT apply to pharmacies that sell both medicines and personal and household consumables? So when we started, we said, in order to get all of us on the same page, for exempt items, you don't charge VAT. So the person is giving an example of pharmacies. When you go into the pharmacies these days, apart from medicine that we buy, people sell all sorts of things that you can imagine, roll-ons, whatever, in the pharmacies. So what happens if this person is supplying pharmaceutical products, as we know, which are exempt, and doing other things which are taxable? Should that person use the certified invoicing system, should that person use the free system that the GRE will make available for even their exempt supply? So I guess that is the question the person is trying to ask in here. The last one that I have in here is, we all know, a couple of weeks ago, um, the GRE went out to some of the most arrested people. So we thought we were having a GRA taxpayer conversation. Now, some of those people have been arrested by police, and, and we know when police comes in, you are moving from a civil conversation into a criminal conversation. And I know very well that some people have been reporting, instead of concentrating to do business, to generate a lot more revenue when we now need revenue to address issues and quickly move away from haircut-related stuff to things that would promote this country. And they need to be reporting to the police station from now and then, just to go and show your face before you come back to work on all those. Is it about time we reconsider that approach, at least for now, um, that this is a new system? Why should taxpayers be arrested on this new system, sent to the police, and months after, they still don't have clarity on when they would even stop going to the police? When some of them do have clear evidence, submitted the evidence to the GRA, that we did communicate that we're having issues. We told you about it. Your officers know about it. But now our staff are at the police. So those are the three questions that I have for now, after which I'll come to our in-person audience, and then we can continue. Thanks. So Phil, then any of you can, can take these questions. Thanks. So yeah, the point on the uh, 
public notice, yes, that point is what I'm not saying. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take that into consideration. In fact... Do you want me to stick you out on timelines? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, just to buttress that point, the next batch of taskers will also be published. Okay. So okay. So that, and okay. we'll add a notice to that effect. All right. Thank you. Before we roll out. Okay. All right. For first of all, okay. Thanks. So there were two more questions. Yes, the supplies and prosecution. Yes, the prosecution bit. Yeah. So on the on the issue of prosecution, um, yes, I, I hear you on that. Um, we have engaged those taskers. Uh, they've written their statements, their GRAs, written statements. Currently, the case has been referred to uh, our legal team. They okay. are looking into it. Uh, it just has to take a course. And, uh, you know, but we continue to engage the taskers that are involved in this. We hope to bring finality to this okay. as soon as possible. Can, can, I, can I, let me yes, add something yes. to that particular? You see, um, tax payment is serious business. Without taxes, the government cannot run. And so in every country, if you play with taxes, it's a major criminal offense. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's even looked at worse than murder. Because by the government not collecting that money, somebody's life sometimes is at stake. So I believe that to avoid some of these things ourselves, let us try to be as law abiding as possible. When Previously, in this country, we've been doing more civil prosecutions than criminal prosecution. And it's not, have, it's not having the effect it should have. It's not, it doesn't seem to be biting enough. So we've been forced to move to criminal prosecution for a lot of things that previously would have invited you, had a simple conversation on. But it's not really working. So if we want to move back to where we do more civil than criminal, then we, the taxpaying public, should show the way and make sure that we do what we have to do. And then it makes life easier for everybody. All right. So thank, thank you. you. Do we have a mic that I can use? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. The pharmaceutical example. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the fact is, it's, uh, it's interesting you brought this point because on the uh, on how we are tackling the pharmacies. Again, that's why it's very, very Thank important you. that can, we... Can somebody help me? That's why it's very important that we implement the solution based on sectors or subsectors, right? Because every sector has its own unique nuances. And for which reason, we've identified this particular issue with respect to the pharmacies. And we have a specific solution that addresses that. So... For if you're a taxpayer who has a pharmacy and you have exam supplies and vertical supplies, those supplies will be put into what we call a master list. Mm -hmm. And the system will be able to identify the supplies that are vertical and the supplies that are not, right? To allow you to be able to uh, charge VAT where it's appropriate. So there's a solution specifically for that purpose. Okay. So, Phil, thanks. Okay. See, um, um, generally, it's just, just the pharmacists. The other people do Correct. make supplies. Yeah. Generally, for mixed supplies, as I said, the system has, um, you yourself, your system should have something for generating because if you're using a cash tell, you have the one that yeah. is zero. In it. And I mentioned earlier that the system helps us do our own accounting. So really, as you issue the invoices, those that are zero will still be zero. But then those that they are taxes on, there'll be a tax on it. Okay. So it shows you, it makes it easier for you to file, even because right now you don't have to go and check all the ones that were zero and yeah. the ones that were not. The system itself helps you to do all that. So that's the general idea to make uh, life easier for all okay. of us. All right. No, so that, that certainly helps. And maybe just on the back of that, so I'm happy Dan came in. The, ask, the one who asked question just used for us as an example, you can apply to yeah. a lot more than that. Um, and maybe just on the back of that, and then I go to the in-person audience. The, the issue is that some people hold the view that if they are issuing invoices and it is just for exempt supplies, they do not use the tax invoice. Their view is that a tax invoice is just for taxable supplies. But if they are doing a mix, they may want to put it on it. What is the expectation of the GRA with the EVAT? 
do you expect that as long as you are a taxable person, everything should run through your system so that we get the code? Or for those that are not, that hold the view that for non-taxable items, they would not use a VAT invoice, they can continue doing that. What is the expectation of the GRA? That as a taxable person, every single invoice, whether it is exclusively exempt, so what I just do, raw vegetables imported into Ghana, and that's all that I'm selling, or you do not expect everything to run through the invoice. What is the current understanding? Thank you. Okay. The general policy is that invariably, we we'll use invoicing for everything. Okay. For everything. Because, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just VAT that uh, is generated. You are doing some business or some transaction, providing a service. There's an income tax component of it. We still need to know what you, what, what you earn. Okay. So, basically, um, the long run is that uh, not just vertebral items, okay. everything, the invoicing will be used for everything. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So can somebody help me? Um, any in-person questions? Otherwise, we'll go back to our online audience. There's a question. All right. I just want to ask. Uh, Mr. Kenya mentioned that the policy is that we are going to use the, the e, uh, VAT for everything. mix everything. Yes. But what is the situation now? now yeah now for those that are being implemented. Okay, so we'll come back to you when, when you've thought through. Yes, in-person questions, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is, especially for the companies with um, who are running ARP system, when it gets to uh, implementation or uh, integration, is there an average time that it takes, or at least you know that it takes for the taxpayers to be ready? And, and I think this specifically for some of multinationals, um, some of the ARP system takes a bit longer because yeah. uh, you sort of need to align with um, the same system that uh, works globally, not just yeah. within the country. Um, so I think it's important to just have um, a view of, on average, how long does it take for that integration to be completed. And then the second question is, in case you have an issue, whether on GRA side or be it on a client side, in relation to um, whether it's internet or anything else, is there sort of an agreed time frame that when it gets to this, when it sort of lasts for say six or six hours or twelve hours without resolution, um, what is the alternative? Okay. Is there a BCP or in place that somebody can invoke it? Okay. Um, I think those two will be okay, okay for me. Thank you. So thank you. So it goes back to the same question I asked and gave the shipping line as an example. What happens? Yeah. Any more in-person questions? Any more from my left? Okay, yes. Good morning. Uh, this is not a question as such, but a observation and request. On the, on the EVAT invoicing uh, screen, there is an option to choose exclusive value and inclusive value. But when we choose inclusive value, it still goes, it does not work. It's only allowing us to use the exclusive rates. Suppose my rate is 100 CDs inclusive of VAT. It does not allow me to choose inclusive VAT. I have to still calculate back the exclusive rate, and that is what I have to enter. So if that can be implemented. Okay. All right. So my partner would address the questions that have come up, and then is there any more questions? Should we take one more? Any more? Any more? OK, so we'll come back to you later. So what you've done and... Um... All right, so I will deal with the last three. Yeah. And then uh, Dan will deal with the first, first one. Okay. So average time for integration. So it depends on the complexity of the taxpayer system. 
It's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, based on the experience so far, a taxpayer doing an integration could take a day, or it could take two days. Uh, you may encounter a taxpayer that has a lot of security features on their system, and therefore you do the integration and then it kicks the system out. And therefore you have to go back and then investigate why you have those issues arising. So if, you, if everything is perfect and you know, we have a smooth integration, it shouldn't take more than two days to do the integration. If it's just uh, one system and we're just integrating to that system. If the technical uh, people on the other side are doing the work that they need to do, it should not take more than two days. And we've done this with a number of taxpayers that we've done integration for. But it could also take as long as a month, depending on the complexity of the taxpayer system. So just to uh, address that question, it just depends, it depends on the system that we're looking at. But what we're also doing is, just to add to this, is that we have, uh, we know a number of software developers in the country who uh, work with uh, big software uh, manufacturers. So for example, we take SAP or Oracle. What we are doing is, we're doing what we call the wholesale integration, where uh, once they, they develop a middleware for, for example, Oracle, Hyperion, or any of these ERPs, and you are a taxpayer that uses that software, you automat your system will basically have to be updated to that middleware, and automatically your system will be EVAT compliant, right? And that will help to fast track the implementation. So that if you have, uh, for example, IPMC, just to use, uh, and let's say IPMC has developed a middleware for EVAX, uh, for Oracle, and you have 100 taxpayers that are using Oracle. All they have to do is just update uh, their instances uh, that's connected to that middleware, and immediately those 100 taxpayer systems will be EVAX compliant. So that is another approach that we are taking to okay. fast track the implementation. Now, on the agreed time frame to resolve issues, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we have a platform for every single taxpayer. And every taxpayer has assigned a relationship manager. So that if you have an issue, you raise that issue on the platform, and immediately the relationship manager and the technical person will attend to you. What we do is, we will ask you to share a remote access of your system with us, and then address the issue right there and then, so that we don't have to physically come to your premises to address the issue. And we've seen this to okay. Okay. work quite well. Inclusive and exclusive. So that's something I will, I will take note of and I, I address with the developers. Yeah. Okay. So I think there was a, there was still a question on the taxable invoice exempt. Then we'll answer that. Okay. Once you're a VAT trader and the system is there, you, you really can't even separate the, what's the, name, the transactions, which I say that the system basically covers everything in VAT. If you are not registered for VAT, that's a different issue. Okay. But now one, you, you, that one, you don't fall within the scope. So as of now, you would not be using the VAT. But once you, you are dealing in vertical items, everything basically is covered. And never I say vertable, even if it's exempt, once you're dealing in it, because you're issuing the invoices, is you can't separate it. So it covers, once you are registered as VAT, everything that you do, the you invoice must cover it. it. That's the, the simple answer. Okay. So maybe now we want to call it of the typical tax invoice as a typical invoicing system. Yes, an so it's an, an invoicing system. It's an electronic invoicing okay. system. But all the right. EVAT was to make it easier for us all to okay. get it. Okay. All right. So. A few questions have come, and maybe then I'm going to pick it from the issue or the example of the card you talked about, all right? So now the question here is, how does the implementation of the EVAT address the phenomenon of selective invoicing, which we want to call carding? So the guy is hooked onto the e-invoicing. I walk into a shop. I eat my prepared full meal with some goat meat. I'm done and I'm going. The guy doesn't give me an invoice. How would the e-invoice conversation that we are having address that, especially in the case of the informal sector? So that's the first question. 
Um, okay, I think this question keeps coming up, but Full has told us by end of month, because the question would GR in the future sanction people who don't have EVAT by 1st January? Okay, so that has been addressed. Um, when would the guidelines for the implementation of EVAT be available? That's also another question that has come up. Um, how does the GRA address the issue of third party invoicing? Okay, so I see them getting to the mind of the one asking this question. So let's assume that um, I have a shopping mall. Um, in the shopping mall, people do come and put in their products um, for you to sell. So sometimes you realize that if you have an issue and you go back to the shopping mall, maybe a washing machine, they will direct you to where they've got it and say, go and talk to these people. So you can go around. So some of the things that you see on the shopping malls are not really the inventory of the shopping mall. So I guess the, quest the, person, the question the person is asking is an instance whereby a third party comes to put certain things in their shop and at the end of the day, they need to pass on all the cash collected. They may get some commission, but they need to pass on all the cash collected back to the person who actually has that. Because for when you are going through a presentation, where ultimately we may be getting with this, it's a scenario whereby you get to the point where you can generate your VAT returns from the system. So remember the guy sold for somebody, he would pass on the money back to the person, but then the output VAT of the person will be showing part of the third party sales. What happens in that scenario? And to even make it a bit complicated, assuming the person brings in, say, fresh meat products from our farms, which may be exempt from VAT. He sells those items, part may be exempt, part may be taxable. He's sending the money back to the person, maybe for his commission. But on the GRA system, you've seen that an action has taken place and you're expecting the VAT, which may ultimately come, but not from the person whose system has been integrated to your system. Closely linked to that are people that perform just invoicing services. So the person may just set up a shop and say that if you want to invoice A, B, C, D, and D, I provide accountancy services to do that. So it is my system that they are issuing from the VAT ultimately is paid to the GRA, but those invoices are being raised for and on behalf of other persons. How is the whole EVAT conversation going to address some of those complicated issues? Thank you. So maybe just three questions and then we'll come back. So when will the guidelines be ready? The last question I asked, and then, yeah. All right, so I'll address the first two questions. So on the <coughs> question of, um, you know, similar to the cardin issue that we mentioned. Uh, so what we've done, in fact, part of the reason why we had this whole uh, arrest taking place is that we sent our men to the various shops mystery shopping right yeah. to do mystery shopping right test purchases and the rest of it and it was at the back of that that we obtained invoices that indicate that uh, these some of these taxpayers have not issued electronic invoices so part of the compliance measures that we put in place as i indicated in my presentation is we have a verification tool that we use to verify invoice so even if it's not you who is uh, verifying that the invoice has been issued to you is genuine or you've not been issued an invoice, occasionally, based on the data that we have at the heartbeat, GRA will occasionally be sending uh, its men to the various taxpayer offices or premises to carry out mystery shopping. And of course, when we identify such cases, then the full effect of the law will be taken into account. So. Compliance is key to the effective implementation of this system, as I mentioned in my presentation. Guidelines. Guidelines have actually been made available. Publicly? Uh, uh, we have, for the taxpayers that we onboarded by uh, pilot, we, in fact, we sent it to you to review. Yeah, so uh, some of the ones yeah. that we see are still yeah. drafts. So I'm talking about publicly. Right. The question is public. Right. So we will make, because we're doing a pilot, we sent to a selected few okay. where that we piloted. Okay. But certainly, is part of our implementation plan to 
make the guidelines public. Public, okay. It has actually been finalized. It's been finalized, yes, okay. So we'll make that available to the public as well. Third party invoice, you want to take that? Wait, um, just before that, the issue of the guidelines, and you said you've been seeing that draft, I, I think I want to make a suggestion to all of us. That sometimes we get documents which purport to come from the GRE or from some other. Let's cross check those documents before we use them. I remember early this year, the income tax bill is in Parliament, it's a public document, but the bill had not been passed as an act. But people were using the rates that were in the bill because it was being circulated. So, let, and if you go and use those rates and GRE comes in, those rates are not what are. So, when we see some of these documents, it's good, yes, they, they come out, but let's sometimes also do a quick cross check to make sure that they're authentic. Otherwise, we might end up applying things that we shouldn't apply to ourselves. And then we get ourselves into a little bit of a mess going on. On the third party invoicing, is again, I think Phil talked about the fact that there are peculiarities with each of the industries that are being addressed as we go on. The pilot is bringing out some of these things. We're coming out with solutions as to how to address them. Because, as you said, the accounting wise, the interesting thing is that for those of us who are using accounting software and some of these things, some of these things are clearly sort of, if we do it properly, we'll have, um, and I'm remembering the little accounting that <laughs> I did when I was beginning, where you have your, uh, what, your containers and your, uh, what, your sales that you're doing for that, and these things are supposed to be, if it's done clearly, it helps when we are putting in the system to address them for you. If you box everything together and mix them up, then it becomes a problem because you, on your system, in your, yourself, you're not creating the distinction. But once we've got to do distinctions, then it's easy to identify it on the system that yes, it comes as bulk, but know that we have a back end. And then in that one, the splits can be done as to this, is, this goes here, this is for this person. Because finally, the person you are selling for, well, so you have an account for the person where it goes to. So then it allows us to do that. But when you put everything together, port query, everything together, then you yourself have created a problem where it's difficult for even anybody or even a system to sort out because you, there, there's nothing that can be. Once you set up your system, then we, we are as we are working. The nice thing about what we are doing is that some of these things are cropping up. Okay. We are dealing with them because we know that once we dealt with them at the lower level, when we go to the lower level, it's even worse than <laughs> those that we've chosen right now. So we are sorting out these things and seeing how best to resolve them. It will help you to formalize your business. It will help us also to know what to tax and know what not to tax, and in whose hands we should tax it. So that's the, what I'll say for now. OK. A few more questions. And this person is asking the question from the non-resident guys. So as we all know, last year, um, precisely April 2022, GRA started the implementation of the requirement for non-resident suppliers of e-commerce and telecommunication services to charge VAT. So this non-resident is based in, say, Bahamas. And now every invoice should be certified. How would that work um, in that instance with those non-residents? Are they expected to comply with this requirement? And if you pick an entity like, say, Apple or Google Store, where people are buying so many things every day, and the guy wants to buy to complete a transaction, the GRE system is down. <laughs> How do you accommodate them? Should the person not sell? And it goes back, because this person keeps coming back, even though it's been asked. And the person is actually asking, Phil, could you explain the online solution again? Because what happens if the internet is down? and they cannot issue their invoices. So that is the first question that I have. The second question is, and please pardon me for this, maybe let me try and ask it. The person is asking, and I think maybe they've called your support team from time and they are not getting assistance, that what steps is Jerry really taking to develop the capacity of his staff to really audit 
and also attend to requirement to support for the CIS. I don't know. And then the last one the person is also asking is that your officers, when they come to do audits going forward, would they still be demanding that invoices should be printed out or would they be giving manual invoices when well, now there's a certified invoicing system? So those are the three questions. So when I just slipped in, what happens if I incur costs? Oh no, I think I've asked that before. Um, the last one I'll ask for now here, then I'll move to this device, is how safe is the system from cyber attack? That's a standard question that is coming up. Thank you, Phil. And then I'm sure you can address these questions, and then we'll try and quickly ask a few more and then start wrapping up. All right. So on the issue of non-resident aspects, uh, the e-commerce, we have already uh, started engaging some of them. But as I said in my uh, presentation, um, you know, we have learned what has worked through the pilots. Okay. And we have, of course, uh, I, uh, in, and in my presentation, I indicated that uh, we are rolling out the implementation in phases and also by sectors, right? So we are bringing all the e-commerce non-resident taxpayers together as one and with a specific solution that we have. And the solution is this. We are working with the fintechs, okay. right? Because for you to operate uh, an e-commerce platform, you need a payment gateway yeah. to effect the transactions okay. on checkout. Okay. So Fintech. what we are doing okay. is we are working with the fintechs to make sure that on checkout, we integrate, we do the integration at that point so okay. that the, before you check out, the data will be sent to GRE, will append signature on that invoice, that payload, and send it back to the fintech company okay. who would have, or who has, who would have, let's say, about 20 or 30 uh, e-commerce businesses. So rather than dealing with the e-commerce uh, uh, businesses, we are actually working with the fintechs who have control of okay. all the... So not with the non-resident provider? Not, we work in consultation with them. Okay. Right? But the major work will be with the fintech, the local fintech companies, right, to, de to, uh, to help us to do the integration. So that's how it work, right? So that on checkout, we will append our signatures on the invoices that are issued. Now, on the issue of... Uh, internet down. I know this issue has been raised before. So let's look at it this way. If, you're, if, if you have a business and your internet is down and you need to be online to issue an invoice, what will you do as a business? Hmm. Right? You try and get the internet up. You try and get the yeah. internet up or you stop selling. Right? Hmm. Uh, because you need internet to operate. That's why. If you don't need internet to operate, let's say we have a number of retail shops yeah. in Ghana here that operate in an offline mode. Yeah. So what we've done is we've given them an offline version of the CIS. Okay. And we've installed that on their local environment so that they can operate in an offline mode uh, for the day. All they have to do is come online just about five minutes and just obtain the signature and just go offline. So that throughout the day, they don't really need internet to assess our system because we have cloned the, uh, so to speak, cloned the CIS, put it onto their local uh, server, almost like the way you have Microsoft Office. Yeah. And you have the <coughs> desktop version of Microsoft Office. Office. That's basically what it is. We've taken the copy of that system, of the invoicing system, and put okay. it onto your software, onto your desktop, so that your system communicates in an offline mode with our system, which is hosted on your local server. So that whether you have on internet or not, it's not really an issue. So for this is for the free ones, what of no, the ones? No, that's for the integration as yeah. well. So for the integration, you have that version? Yeah, we have that version. So can we say that as taxpayers, if the GR internet goes down for, say, 12 hours, I can still issue, because if you send guys out to go and do mystery shopping, and the guys come to buy, say, a product for me, and they don't see the code, Am I sure my managers are safe? Yeah, because, uh, well, let me just explain this. <laughs> okay. Uh, just take, uh, take a while to explain this. So the GRE system, of course, sits on the GRE server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So what we've done is we've taken a copy of the GRE system, which operates okay. in an online mode. Okay. We've taken a copy of that. And then we've gone to the TASPS premises. Okay. And we've asked them, okay, give, it, give us access to your server. And we've basically copied and pasted the GRE system onto their local server. Mm, okay. Right? It's almost as if you are communicating with a system in real time, right, in an online mode. But now the system is operating an offline mode, communicating with your system locally in that okay. local environment. Okay. Right? So that all the invoices that you are issuing in the local environment can be authenticated mm. with commission general signature. So okay. you will be communicating as though you are operating an online, online mode, system. even okay. though you are operating an offline mode. So the takeaway point is the internet being off for a couple of it's hours is not an issue. No, not that. Oh, issue. okay, not an issue. That's interesting. The app is there. You're using it. Okay. Offline. Okay. So we'll pick this up later because it keeps coming. Um, few more questions. I know we've just gone past twelve. My intention is we should be leaving in the next few minutes, but these are a few more questions, and maybe if I have your authorization to send the questions I'm unable to ask to GRI, I think it helps all of us develop and create a kind of system. So I'll forward them all to you and then you can look them, look at them later. So the question that is being asked here is that in situations that mistakes are made in the invoicing and the error enters the GRI system, what opportunity is there for a correction? So maybe as an accountant, I'm going to ask, are there options for credit notes, debit notes, if I make a system error, what other opportunities are there? Another one is asking, is there an option on the system for companies in the free zones that are VAT exempted? Who bears the cost <laughs> of the migration, or, sorry, of the DND when there are delays from the GRA system? So who bears the cost? So from, what I'm getting is that there should be no delay because there is a replica that you've loaded locally on the server. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. For VAT on imported services, will we issue an e-invoice to ourselves? So the person account for VAT on imported services, should they issue that on themselves? All right, so I, probably this person asked without looking at the fact that the law has changed, but let me still read it. It says, per Act 1082, a taxable person must comply within a year of implementation. What if the GRA does not contact me within the year? And after a year, I am not still on the EVAT platform. Are there going to be any penalties for that? And lastly, would GRA still be issuing dispensation letters to selected EVAT businesses? So the dispensation is, I guess, those letters for you to issue your own internal generator. So I think, I've, I think I'm done with all the questions now. So Joyce, just in case you think I've not asked all the questions, you can just prompt me. I, I think I've asked all the questions broadly, yes. So those are six loaded questions. Whilst we try and bring the curtains down. Thank you. That's all, sorry. So the last one was, would GRA still issue dispensation letters? Ah, okay. Then before that, if GRA does not contact me within a year, the person was referring to 1082, and the year goes past, what are the penalties if GRA did not contact them? And then I asked the one on VAT on imported services, should they issue e-invoices to themselves? And then I asked about how safe the system is. Um, and then who bears the cost of delays for, say, demorages if there are delays from the GRE system? And then is there any option for free zones? Yes, so those are the questions that came. Yeah. I'll start from the um, bottom. Dispensation, once the system goes for you, there will be no dispensation letters. Okay. Basically, you'll be informed, as in, I'm combining the two, you'll be informed as to when you are supposed to commence. Um, the other thing we should also remember is that we can actually voluntarily request that we should be put on it. So if we believe that the system will help us do the things we need, it's not yet our turn, we can still apply to the GRE to be put on it. 
But then, since the law has put it such that the Commissioner General must inform you before you start, if you don't start, the Commissioner does inform you and you haven't started, I don't think that we can come back and kind of say that we haven't informed you, you haven't started, and why haven't you started? So maybe the omission will be ours. We might find out and say that, no, you are supposed to be part of it, do it, but then we won't be in a position to prosecute you for that because you wouldn't have fallen foul of the law. Then the free zones one becomes a bit interesting. Again, um, for free zone companies, normally it's when they are dealing with the local economy, which would be an import item, that is when they will be required to issue an invoice. Uh, uh, anyway. But that one is done through the customs system. So unless they are doing sales, and that's where they should, they are supposed to actually pass all their activities through the custom system, the ICOMS. So that is taken care of at that point. And so, and if they are purchasing, then they will be issued an invoice. So I'm not sure where what the option is is in that sense. Uh, yeah. So that is for free zones. That's the way. I, Okay. Yeah. Maybe you can take it there. All right. So for the transition provision, I think he, he, he talked about that. So if, of course, you have not been contacted, then you know um, you don't have to. You can, of course, apply voluntarily to be onboarded. Uh, imported services, yes, you actually do need to issue an okay. invoice, yes. To yourself? And to yourself. So we, okay. you know, we, we have the free invoicing system that will accommodate that. So okay. if you don't have your own invoicing system, you can use that to issue an invoice. And then also for, yeah, he's addressed the issue of uh, the free zones. The costs uh, with respect to delays, we've talked about that, that if there are delays in the system, you report to GRA. We have technical people who are, of course, uh, available to help you with that. Uh, but I'm not sure where the cost is coming from, where there's delay. So is I give the cost? example on the demorage, for example. Yes. So day one, I can't issue. Mm -hmm. Day two, I can't issue. Now the customer then finally gets the invoice on day three, goes to the port and they said that your goods have stayed in the container longer than the free period. So pay for the use of the no, containers. No, 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 what no. happens in that instance? No, we, our men are constantly... Yes, yes, yes. yes. Who has no issue? The clearing agent or who? So the the shipping line, the shipping agent, yes. ought to issue invoices for people to continue the process that they've made payments. So now go and take your goods from the containers. So if there are any delays in there, the requester is the the one asking the question is asking who bears that cost? Because maybe I have seven days free period. And we all know how people do things. I came on the seventh day to come and pay. Mm -hmm. When I came, the system is down. The issue of the system doesn't want to be subjected to mystery shopping. So he or she doesn't know whether the person sitting there is <laughs> really a GRA official or not. So the system is down, the system is down. The person then comes on day eight, gets it. But by the time you get to the port, you've gone past the seven days. So now pay the mortgage. So the question the person is asking is who should pay the demorage? Should it be the customer? Should it be the one required to raise the invoice? Or the one that caused them the trouble in this case, the GRA system, should bear the cost, which is the question that the person is asking. So who bears the cost of DND? So this is the marriage, when there are delays from GRA system. So even though Phil has told us that it should not happen because of the local replica, assuming that it does happen, who should bear the cost? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an interesting one. Yeah. No, it happens. If you don't clear quickly, things happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, we have onboarded, uh, we are currently in the process of onboarding Meridian Ports. Okay. GPHA is online at this point as we speak. Each time we have issues, you raise the issues, immediately our men are on the ground okay. to resolve those issues. So you're not going to have that. Issue. Okay. Issue. All right. In person, guests, any comments? Can we switch over to the slides as we close off, please? In person, audience, no questions, no questions. Great. So, thank you very much, my panel members, Phil and Dan. Um,
we are so excited that you had a chance to come in today to work with us. To our audience online and in here, please, we expect you to leave here with just a few points. Don't attempt to do too much. Just one, two, three things that you've taken away from this short session on what you are going to do around EVAT. If you have any questions, please contact the chamber. Your questions will be directed to me, and I'll get it to the appropriate quarters, either at the Ministry of Finance or to the GRA. For those who want to read more, you have all these materials. If you have a mobile phone, you can just take out your mobile phone and then scan. And you have all those materials that you can get for free to read, probably as a bedtime story, in order to ensure compliance. So on this note, I will say thank you very much for joining us once again for the Tax Dialogue Series. We look forward to seeing you during the next edition. Thank you very much. Anything else? No. All right. So we are done. And um, I understand there is some snacks. Lunch. Oh, OK. So it's been upgraded to lunch. There's some lunch outside. So for our online guests, sorry you won't be able to join us for lunch. Next time, please try and join us here, and then you can have lunch with us. So thank you, everyone.